But we're, we're grateful, so thankful. Thank you, thank you. But we're so thankful for all who participated last week in, in that wonderful portrayal. And, and what stood out, one of the things that uh, stood out for me, I mean, all of it was just marvelous. It was just a fabulous um, event that redounds to the glory of God. And we who were here were basking in, in the, the wonder of Christ's birth by way of, of the portrayal, what we saw in Scripture being portrayed. And one of the things that, that stood out as, as uh, being uh, just, just an awesome, uh, wonderful, wonderful experience to watch and behold was the... The, the number of saints that took the time to memorize long swaths yeah. Yeah. of Scripture. Amen. Amen. Remarkable. Yeah. And, and they stood here, <laughs> walked <laughs> the floor, um, sang the songs. Uh, just, it was just marvelous to see God's people pouring out, again, their reflections in the Word of God, which says to me that they spent a number of hours laboring to remember the Word of God. That is such a rich, rich experience, that of hiding God's Word in our heart. There is nothing greater by way of a treasure that you can put in your spirit, that you can have than the Word of God. And to hide it in your heart like that, and then to share it with other saints is just a remarkable, remarkable, um, and it, it's worthy of, of thanksgiving. It's worthy of our thanks to you, the people of God, the numbers of you that uh, participated by way of... of uh, joining in, in that, that, um, that display of God's grace in your life. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Long passages of Scripture in, in Matthew, long passages of Scripture in Luke. Just, it was just a remarkable. I, I just kept thinking over and over again and again um, of the event and we, we, were, we were in, in the presence of God, in the presence of his spirit, his people, as his people were sharing the word. And, and you know what? You, you can't give a better gift to anyone. Not diamonds, not rubies, not gold or silver. No better gift you can give to anyone than the Word of God. Amen. It is the one treasure that you will take out of this world. Everything else, you're going to leave it. The rings, the gold, <laughs> the silver, all of it, we're leaving it. The one treasure that we will take out of the world, out of this world, when we go, is that which was hidden in our spirit, the, the Word of God. And I, I trust, beloved, that you're spending time in the Word of God, not, not just little clips of it. I, I mean just immersing and bathing your soul in, in the, the, the fountain that flows from Scripture. It is that which reveals God. You cannot know God apart from the Word of God. Your relationship with the Word of God is the measure of your relationship with God. Little time in the Word is little time with God. There is no replacement. There is nothing that you and I can do apart from Studying and spending time, memorizing, reading, sharing the word of God. Nothing apart from that that will draw us closer to Jesus Christ. And 
that is a treasure that we share as the people of God. Amen. The precious, precious word of God. I want to take you to this passage that's going to get us back to Matthew. In fact, uh, let, let's start here in Matthew chapter 1. And then I want to take you to another passage. Matthew chapter 1, we've uh, been here for a couple of weeks since we started here in, in December. Here in Matthew chapter 1, and it's talking here in chapter 1 about the birth of Jesus Christ. This idea of the genealogy of Jesus. But uh, Matthew is, is just, too, uh, just a marvelous um, record of the birth, life, teachings, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the story of Jesus Christ. Matthew and Luke, they, they give a rich genealogy, background in terms of the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. And there's a reason for it because they connect his lineage to the kingship of David, King David. They connect him also in Luke, they connect him all the way back to Adam. So that as king, as a descendant of Adam, and then finally as a, as a descendant of King David, he, that is Jesus Christ, has legitimate legal rights and standing to be the heir of the throne of David. Why is that important? It's important because, and we're going to read here in a moment um, about the actual birth, but it's important because of what God is doing. I shared with you uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, or rather, that the, the idea that Matthew, God bless you, the idea of what God is doing in Matthew, especially as he establishes for us Jesus' rightful position to take up the throne of his forebearer, his father, in, in scripture calls him, uh, David. King David was the father of, of um, the Lord Jesus in that he's the the, the, uh, the progenitor that the, the king through which, through which God would bring Jesus into the world, the lineage that God would bring Jesus into the world flows through the loins of King David. Amen. Matthew makes that clear. And so here in, in Matthew, when we're reading here in Matthew chapter 1, I want to start reading at verse 21, and she will, this is the angel, this is the report of the angel to Joseph, saying, Joseph, you are a son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us shared with you a few weeks ago the, the significance of, of what God is doing 
in sending his son, one of the things that God is doing in sending his son is to fulfill what was written about Jesus. The text says it right there in verse 22. All of this was done. Now, now just, just so that you'll understand the flow. The angel is talking to Joseph, starting in verse 20. You follow with me? While Joseph thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The angel goes on to say, and she will bring forth a son, and you, Joseph, shall call his name Jesus, or Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins, period. The angel has stopped talking to Joseph at that point. It's in quotes because the angel has stopped talking. Now in verse 22, who's talking? Well, this is Matthew. Matthew looks back at all of this because he's the one who's recording the history of the birth, the life, teachings of Jesus and the death, burial, and resurrection. This is Matthew's gospel. So Matthew gives what I would call editorial comment. Now, it's the word of God, but he's giving comment about everything that has gone on, that has taken place. He's looking back at all of the events and everything that's happened when he writes this sometime uh, during the first century, sometime around 50, between 50 and 60 A.D., he's looking back and now putting together a historical record for those who will read his record. And he's saying all of this was done so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord. The Father sent the Son in order to fulfill what the Old Testament said about Jesus Christ. Jesus was sent to finish or to fulfill or to satisfy, complete the teachings of the Old Testament that were spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. This first Point that I made a few weeks ago was that what was being fulfilled in Jesus was a political statement relative to Israel. God promised in Isaiah, told Ahaz, I am with you, Israel. And a virgin will conceive as evidence that what I'm saying to you is accurate and true. That was the promise God gave to Isaiah. And so what we lift out of that is that it was a political, that it fulfilled a political promise that God would sustain Israel no matter what or who attempted to destroy. I'm with you. During Ahaz's time, it was the king of the northern tribes, uh, Razin, and it was the king of Syria who were attempting to form an alliance to take out Judah, the southern kingdom. And God told Ahaz, king of the southern kingdom, don't worry about it, I got your back. That was a political statement that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And not only was it a political statement, which basically says that God is standing for and protecting the nation of Israel. And it does not matter what kings, czars, presidents or anyone else thinks about Israel. What really matters is what God is doing with the nation. 
he promises to keep them. Now, right now, they are in blindness. They don't know that Jesus is their Lord. God has, in a sense, as I, I was taught, um, God has put them on a shelf. And at some future time, he's going to take Israel back off the shelf, and he's going to deal with them because of their unbelief. But right now, they're on a shelf. And in, polit in a political sense, God has not turned his back on Israel. Paul says this in Romans chapter 10, chapter 11. God has not forsaken his people. And so politically, politically, when, when the, the prophet says, the virgin shall be with child, they shall, shall bear a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel. That Emmanuel, God with us, says God is with Israel. That's political. But then it also identifies for us this promise here written in Matthew, quoted by Matthew, quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Matthew, but he's under another dispensation. What do I mean by that? Another time period. Matthew's not back there with Isaiah. But Matthew quotes Isaiah. Matthew looks back at what Isaiah said, looking at Jesus, and says, this is what God meant to happen. And he says, so that that verse might be fulfilled, God sent his son. So in the dispensation of grace, that's where Matthew is writing. Matthew is writing under the, the time period, as it were, what we call the, this, uh, this dispensation, how God is dealing with men today. God is not dealing with men today the way he dealt with Israel and other nations. Amen. The Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We're in an age of grace and truth. God essentially has, has taken, has, has taken uh, a stance of, of patience with the world that wasn't displayed as clearly as it is today. Today, we're in the dispensation of grace. We're in the time frame in God's plan where he's offering grace, favor, and mercy through Jesus Christ. Matthew records for us that when Jesus came, it is God with us. What is that? The declaration of God's favor, first and foremost, spiritually upon the church. In the Old Testament, politically, God was with Israel. In the New Testament, God is with the church, spiritually. And today, we are either in Adam or we're in Christ in the church, one or the other. You cannot share two domains, two dominions, two realms. You are either saved and in Christ, which means you're in the church under God's favor, or you're still in Adam. Every one of us were born in Adam, born in sin. The sin nature coursed through our, our, our very spirits and souls through our bloodline, we, we transferred the sin nature from one generation to the next. And all of us were, were doomed, destined to experience the rejection and wrath of God were it not for the dispensation of grace and favor. God interrupted the dispensation of law stopped the law which condemns us, interrupted the dispensation of law, and started a new dispensation called grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And how does he, how does he begin it? He begins it with Emmanuel. I'm with you. But how? He's with us in the church. No unsaved person can claim that God is with them. 
Not in this sense. In fact, it's just the opposite. God is against you. The Bible says that God hates the actions of the wicked every day. You are not under the favor of God. The Bible says in John, out of the words of Jesus, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Those who will be condemned are those who will not believe on Jesus Christ. God's favor, his choice favor, is for his bride, the church. That's a spiritual relationship. And so you and I as the church... We, we, are, we are so blessed and beyond, beyond, beyond our imagination that we have the promise of his presence, personal presence with us. And that personal presence with us is for the church, the body of Christ. And we enjoy the fullness of his presence in this world through the church. He does not relate to us, as I've stated before, does not relate to us apart from our connection to the body of Christ. When we get saved, we're instantly placed into the body of Jesus Christ, the church. So his personal dealings with us first come by way of the community. We have to first be in the community called the body of Christ for him to relate to us individually. We don't get saved and uh, uh, um, develop a, an individual relationship with, with Jesus Christ apart from the church, the body of Christ. It is because we're in the body of Christ that we have and can engage in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if we reject and diminish and discard or ignore the church, we essentially are diminishing the significance of his bride, the church. And hence, our relationship with him is diminished. There are many, many today who have said, I don't need the church to know God, or I don't need the church. I don't have to go to church. Um, and for whatever reason, they basically are rejecting the means by which God wants, the Lord Jesus, by, the means by which the Lord Jesus wants to relate to us. He wants to relate to us first and foremost corporately as a body. And it's out of that body that our individual relationships with him are developed. I can't reject this or diminish this and expect that I can have this. In fact, Jesus says, if you don't love, John says, if any man says, I love God and does not love his brother, he's a liar. The evidence of my love for God is seen by how I relate to you. I can't say I love him and spurn you. It's my love for him that causes me to love you. If I'm authentic in my love for God, it will be evidenced by how I relate to you. If I spurn, reject, discard, diminish, ignore, avoid, evade, circumvent, sidestep, shun, reduce, devalue, shrink, disregard, discount, or overlook you, I am overlooking the Lord Jesus. We need each other. It, it's just the way he's designed spiritual relationship with him. It, it won't happen any other. You will not, and I'll say it in time and time again, you will not have a rich, satisfying experience with Jesus Christ alone. 
It just doesn't happen like that. I've often talked about Living Room Baptist Church, right? Let me clarify this. I speak of Living Room Baptist Church in the sense that if I, as an individual, start with my wife, my own, my own sense of what the church is, that's, that's an illegitimate church. Yet on the other hand, Living Room Baptist Church might be, can be a real church. If it's formed with authentic believers and organized according to the instructions of the New Testament for the local church. So there are many, in fact, the, the New Testament, the first, the first century church, largely was started in the living room. And it was, wasn't until later in church history when, when the church became um, uh, un, under Catholicism, when the church um, was focused more on a building and, and the gathering of, of believers together in, in, under one, one roof. And so now the, the association of the building, we call that the church, when in reality the church is the people. It's you and I. So on the one hand, yeah, Living Room Baptist Church is, is illegitimate if you're trying to replace that with the relationship that we have in the local church, but yet the local church, a local church can be organized in a home. And many a church started by starting in the home because genuine and authentic believe, believers got together and decided, let us as a community organize ourselves according to the New Testament requirements for the local church. That is a legitimate living room Baptist church. An illegitimate living room Baptist church is where I, I'm sitting and watching uh, Creflo Dollar. You knew I was going to say that, right? See, that, that's not, that's not, that's, you can't replace this with, with some media or technology. We, you can't. Because God, God designs the church to be life on life, people to people, face to face, connecting. In fact, that's why he calls it a body. So when the Bible says, you shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us, Matthew sees the, the eminency of of, of Jesus' coming and creating, and he records right here in his gospel that Jesus said to his disciples, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So in Matthew's, in Matthew's um, understanding of, of Jesus and the fulfillment that he brings, he now sees and connects what Isaiah says he connects that promise to the church. Emmanuel, God is with the church. It's a political statement. It is a spiritual statement. And then finally, as I stated, it is also a theological statement. When the Bible says you shall call his name Emmanuel, that's, that's theology. Theo, meaning God, ology, the study of God. And every one of us, every believer ought to love theology. Amen. And if you don't, <laughs> you've got a problem. <laughs> because it is theology that reveals Jesus. Amen. It's, it's God, the study of God. That's what theology is. It's merely the study of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And you can't love him without Scripture, the proclamation of Scripture in the field. So it's biblical. It's biblical information. So we get Bible references that teach us how to understand and to build theology. So our understanding of Jesus Christ is biblical 
and theological. It takes Bible passages and we develop a concept, a theological concept of who Jesus is. And so when the Bible says his name shall be called Emmanuel, what is he talking? He's talking about the nature and person of Jesus Christ. You and I, every believer, needs to have an accurate theology of who Jesus is. Amen. You cannot afford to have an inaccurate, flawed, fragmented understanding of who Jesus is if you're going to grow and develop as an authentic believer. So every authentic believer should, should be, be so hungry for theology. God, I want to know you. We, we should be starving in our souls to know Jesus. Don't be afraid of the word. Think of the concept. I want to know you. Davis says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. We need to long and yearn for Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's come to do. That's, that's the summation, as it were, of, of our theology of, of Jesus Christ. Who is he and what has he come to do? What has he come to do? So we study the nature in person of Jesus Christ. So where do you start if you're looking for God? Well, if there's an authentic interest in, in who God is, where do you start? If you want to find the true and living God, what's the reference point? Do, do you go to Google? <laughs> and if you go to Google, You'll see an assortment of, of resumes, persons or entities or non-entities, ideas, concepts that are considered to be God. I would suggest, rather than Googling, I would suggest if you really want to know who God is, start with Jesus. Why? Because he's called <laughs> Emmanuel, God with us. This idea of who God is and what he has come to do is clearly made known in the theology of who Jesus is. The legitimacy of his nature, that he is divine, it's proclaimed in scripture. He himself proclaimed it. Um, he is a God. Um, who represents himself by, by so many metaphors so that you and I can understand who he is. Think about this. His divine and eternal decision to create and engage with you and I, even though we're fallen and lowly, what does he do? He becomes lowly with us. He doesn't remain seated at the right hand of the Father and give instructions from his, his, uh, his, his throne, high and lifted, as Isaiah says in 6. But rather, he takes on humanity to be lowly with us. I want you to see this, this wonderful passage here in Hebrews. Turn with me in Hebrews Look at Hebrews chapter 2. His presence is a lowly presence. You with me? Look at Hebrews chapter 2. I'm starting at verse 14. Speaking of Jesus, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, 
that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. What did he do? He took on our, our, our flesh. He took on our lowly estate. He didn't take on our fallenness, but he took on our flesh. He became flesh so that he could partake of those things that you and I suffer. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. And starting with verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is the word of God is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, that is Jesus Christ, God the Son, let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us, with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. He himself was made like us. He's able to sympathize with us. He is with us to sympathize with us. He did some marvelous things in his, in his earthly time, and he did it with audience. He fed 5,000 people in, in Matthew's gospel, 5,000 Jewish people there in Galilee, and then 4,000 Gentile people as recorded in Mark. He gave sight to the blind, not in some hidden place, but so that a community could see. He healed the lame man, the demoniac, in public. He raised Lazarus after four days in the tomb, in public. He walked on water in view of his disciples. He spoke to the wind and the waves as if they were his children, always in the company of others. So the, the theology of his presence is clear. He's Emmanuel. And it should bring to us infinite and eternal value in terms of the human spirit. In fact, there are these three, three aspects that God with us demonstrate glorious hope for you and I human value, that we have value apart from Jesus Christ. We have no value. It's the fact that he came in likeness of flesh that declared humanity has value. I love the way one of our beloved Christmas songs gathers this, this idea, this theological perspective of Jesus Christ. Listen to these words. Long lay the world in sin and ever pining. Just, just doleful. Humanity was just broken and doleful, hopeless. Till he appeared. And then the soul felt worth. He brings to us value. He brings to us human identity. That apart from him, we have no sense of identity. Isn't this amazing? That prior to Jesus, our individual identities are worthless. Presidents, kings, 
congressmen, rich men, poor men, personal ident identities and personal esteem apart from Jesus is worthless. He brought significance to our identity. And what did he do? He put us in a community. Isn't that amazing? He didn't let us continue to wander about as strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. He didn't let us continue to into our individual silos of existence, but he, he brought us into the family of God and gave us his identity. This, this is a marvelous reality. Human value, human identity, because God is with us. I also would like to share with you that he has given to us because he's with us. Human ethics. Human ethics. Human value. Human identity. And human ethics. When, when the angel says to Joe, the angel says to Joseph, Joe, that which is born, you will call his name Yeshua because he will save his people. See, in his coming, he's declaring something is wrong with us. Emmanuel with us declares something is wrong with us apart from him. I'm reading... Um, reading through uh, Ravi Zacharias' uh, book here called Jesus Among Secular Gods. These secular gods are concepts that have replaced God, the true and the living God. And Ravi Zacharias is, is so poignant in, in, in pointing out one of the secular gods that I believe affects our self-perception of who we are. I, I think we as believers get, get kind of hung up in, in, in these secular concepts of God. Now, we would never call it the concept God. But when you think about, for instance, one of the secular gods is called humanism. And humanism defines itself as it's an ethical, think about this. <laughs> humanism is an ethical, scientific, philosophical, progressive philosophy. Think about that. That rejects the notion of God. We no longer need to look to a cosmic savior, according to humanists. Humanists say, we can fix this ourselves. My wife and I, my wife and I were um, look, looking at um, some movie, um, but we, we noted how that a number of movies these days are, are what, what, what many refer to as, listen to the term, dystopian. Now, I know it's not a word that you and I normally bandy about, but think about what it is. It's the opposite of a utopia. Utopia is perfection, the perfection of community. Where, 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 where is a utopian community to be found? The only utopian, perfect community that will be found is in Christ, the church. Once we're finally glorified in his presence, then we will experience a utopian perfection. Humanists are in pursuit of utopian society without God. And all they get is dystopia. What is that? Beleaguered humanity. The suicide rate continues to increase, but they call it progress, progress. Murder rate continues to 
get worse and worse. They call it progress, humanists. What, what Robbie uh, Zacharias comes to, and he, he basically says in his book that, that uh, their hope for, for progress is really going to wind up being nothing more than the rubble of fallen foundations. Movies, movies like The Minority Report, Millennium, movies like Metropia, The Maze Runner, Max, The Matrix, and it goes on and on. Our, our, our culture keeps creating these dystopian concepts. What is life without God? And they're trying to fix these cataclysmic events and problems, but without God. It's, 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 it's the rejection of God that brings about the destruction of humanity. God is the only hope in the person of Jesus Christ for the res restoration of humanity. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, brings human value, brings human identity, and brings sense of human ethics. In Titus chapter 2, Paul said to Titus, for the grace of God, which has appeared to all men, is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That apart from Jesus, apart from Jesus, it's just worldly lust and destruction. But our hope is in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself to redeem us from all lawless deeds, that he might purify himself unto himself. What? He wants to purify unto himself what? A community. The church. He purifies the church, the community, unto himself. We, we are, we are, as it were. We have a new identity. And our identity is, is that we are, we are in Christ. And we experience the beauty of his presence. And, and, this, and, and the, the, lavish, the lavish lifestyle that we live in Christ is joyous. I mean, I, I experienced that last week. I mean, it was just marvelous. It's, it's, like, it's like this stuff just gets better and better. I, I so enjoy what I enjoy. And, you know, another part of what I enjoyed last week wasn't just in my hearing what I heard. But I looked at the faces of those who were quoting scripture. They were enjoying it. <laughs> they, they were enjoying what they were saying and what they were doing. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. There's this blessedness of, of our... Of our um, of our gathering as a community of faith. And I want you to see it in, in, in living color, in, in the color of your mind, in your imagination. Look with me in, in Luke chapter 24, and, and we're winding down here. Are you there? All right. I, I want to start reading at, um, I'm, actually, I'm going to sort of cherry pick because until we get to the, the, uh, the main text, I want you to see. I, I want you to start with me here at uh, verse 14. They talk together of all the things which had happened. And this is after the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And these two men were walking together on the road that leads to the city called Emmaus. They were walking together, talking about everything. Jesus was, was crucified, he was buried, and there's talk, there's talk. Now they haven't seen him yet, but there's talk that he's risen. And they talked together about all these things which had happened. 
So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So Jesus blocked their ability to discern that it was him. Now imagine here they are talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And who appears? <laughs> Jesus. And they didn't know it. There's, there's something, there's something I, I think, by way of, a, a, I'll call it an allegory, not maybe an allegory, but a spiritualization. I don't want to natu naturally spiritualize, but I do want to, in this point, that sometimes we, we miss Jesus, and he's right there with us, ever so close, because we're looking for something else. And, and what, what he does, what he did in this, in this in, in this story, he revealed himself to them, but he did it in a progressive way. Look, look at this. Look at this. Their eyes were restrained. And then Jesus said, what kind of conversation is this that you have one with another as you're walking? And you seem to be sad. Then one of those who were with him called Cleopas answered and said, what? Are you some kind of stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and who crucified him. But we were hoping that he was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, oh, you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning from Moses, that is in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, every one of the prophets, all the way through to Malachi, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Isn't that amazing? Jesus gave them an Old Testament survey pointing out where every book of Scripture is pointing to him. Look at verse 30, 28. And they drew near to the village where they were going. He indicated that he would have gone farther. So they're getting ready to go into the house where they were going. And Jesus made like he was going to continue to go on. And look, 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 look. But they constrained him. Oh, won't you stay and abide with me? Us. For it is toward evening and the day is far spent. He went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with, <laughs> that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said, to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Isn't this amazing? And I paused so that you all would get the sense that what Jesus is doing here, what he did for these two uh, disciples was to manifest himself by way of their identity with a community. And it wasn't an individual, as it were, in this scenario, 
But what was important is that they themselves as a group, they would discern Jesus' presence. They knew him. They said to one another, did not, look at this, verse 32, did not our plural heart, singular, burn within us? How is it that a group, or maybe it's just two, I don't know how many were in the house, how is it that a group, or at least two, hearts can burn singularly? It says, did not our heart, singular, burn within us? I would suggest to you that they shared, this is shared communion. This is shared intimacy. This is not individual. This is a shared experience, a shared revelation of Jesus Christ. You ever wondered why you and I are not permitted to take communion? at Living Room Baptist Church by ourselves. <laughs> Think about it. Jesus says, as often as you do this, oh, well, what, what, if, what if every morning I just gave myself communion? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that I am defying the nature of what it is. <laughs> it's called communion <laughs> I can't I can't commune with myself the text reveals that communion happens in a community and so I can't give myself communion Jesus assembled his disciples in the upper room and he had communion with them there is this rich rich heritage that we share in community, every, every one of us, no doubt God is with us as an individual. But more importantly, from God's perspective, he is with us, the community. And the benefits of that is that we individually experience the blessedness of God's presence with us. There is no need, there is no need we discover to be alone because he's with us. His peace, his hope, his security, his companionship, his provision, his truthfulness, all of this is ours and it's, it's validated in community. I am absolutely wrong to develop a theology of Jesus Christ by myself. Theology needs to be developed in community. In fact, in fact, that's what the, the, the community does. The community validates what it is we're to believe. It's, it's the church that validates true faith. You're absolutely wrong to think that you alone, by yourself, can know alone God's will for your life. God wants to work through the community of faith. And what does he do? He shapes our thinking through the community. So that, so that the church is the essential, the essential, the essential place where God manifests his presence. If you and I are walking with him, it requires that you and I be actively engaged with where God is working. Where is God working? Okay, let's start all over. In the beginning, God, right? (laughs) 
Where is God working? It's in the church, beloved. It's in the body. He's working. The, 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 um, the force of his energy is, is being manifested through the body of Christ in community. So what do we do? As a church, what do we do? We gather together. This is called Man of Bible Baptist Church. And we gather together to um, agree that we're going to fulfill all of the requirements for the local assembly, which God gave to the apostles. That's what church membership does. It says we as a community of believers, as professing believers, we're committing ourselves as a community of faith to fulfill all of the requirements for the local church in, in this assembly. And it's, it's a huge list of things that, that we as, as believers are, are uh, committed to accomplish as the church. And that cannot happen. It won't happen in isolation. When Jesus says, uh, when Matthew records for us the teaching of the Lord, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God, he's with us. He's with us, the community. If we share in the lavish, the lavish uh, um, portrayal of who he is in community. I, and, and, and you know what? I, I love you, beloved. I just do. I, I love who you are and what God is doing in, in your life. You mean, you mean so much to Jesus Christ. And you and I cannot ignore or diminish the value of what he's doing in community. And when we do, it's at our own peril. If you want to grow, and I'll state it again, your spiritual growth can only happen in community. You are with us, Father, to grant to great, uh, to great lengths you went to grant to us human value, human ethics, and human identity. You've created for us a wonderful identity. And we no longer want to be known as people apart from God, but now we want to be seen as or through the lens of who Jesus is. We're Christ ones. We're Christians. We identify with you, Lord Jesus, and with your suffering for us. We're members of your body, the church. And we renounce every, every alliance, every allegiance, that would threaten our identity with you. God forbid that our alliance with you would be compromised through an alliance, a secular alliance, but help us in our preparation for this new year to purify our devotion to you.